Welcome to The Young and the Restless. I'm Olivia. I'm Victor. And I'm Zach. And this is the podcast where the question is, do I feel lucky? Well, do ya? Punk. Now I lay me down to sleep. I dreamt I had a soul to keep. And if I die before I wake, will that dream just go on for its own sake? So the heat dome is finally over. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that seems to be happening every year lately. Yeah, it happened both years I lived in Seattle. Or the, yeah, it didn't didn't used to. The dome effect only happened one year when I was there, but like a severe heat wave. I don't really know what the difference is. Like, is the dome just that it, because we're surrounded by mountains, we get like caught in like a little heat bubble? That's, yeah, <laughs> that's as far as my meteorolic knowledge goes. It has something to do with like atmospheric pressure or density or something where it just like traps the heat. And like the dangerous part of the dome is that it can't cool down overnight. Yeah, it was still pretty hot at night. I thought the heat dome was when the like video panels of the sky are made of <laughs> like start to overheat, like they malfunction. And so they're putting off too much heat. And so it causes like a local problem. They have to fix all the stuff uh, in the middle of the night when the panels are off. Yeah. <laughs> so when the the um the grip department on on the Truman show that we're living in mm-hmm. right <laughs> have to like come in and solve some electrical problems. Speaking of natural disasters, LA has its first tropical storm warning this weekend for the first time. Oh. Oh, oh I think I saw that. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think it's going to be that bad in LA, but uh but it's unprecedented the warning itself. Sunday is supposed to be uh, like an inch of rain and like 10 mile per hour winds all day, which isn't insane, but uh, you know, it's like the, it's on the outskirts of a hurricane, Hurricane Hillary. Um, and it's Didn't possible. Didn't we already have a Hurricane Hillary? Yeah, I voted for her. <laughs> Same. <laughs> yeah. But if it does, if it ends up being worse than that, if it, worse than projected and we get like a full-on blast then this will be an interesting historical recording i think it's funny to imagine that uh that like the studios are behind it somehow they're trying to break the strike (laughs) they're they're finally using their weather machine i saw they were like cutting down trees so that people didn't have shade like people on strike didn't have any shade on the sidewalk yeah. I was like, no, we're just uh, we're doing our yearly maintenance, <laughs> trimming the palm trees. Yeah, God, that sucks. Yeah. yeah, and it's such a spread of people out there too that are being affected by the strikes. It's it's cool when you see like super famous rich people out there because it's like pure solidarity. You know, you know they'll they'll be fine for a long time if they a lot of them if they never work again. But a lot of the people out there. You know, like I, I imagine it's it's would be a great feeling just to break into writing professionally, but to but they are they're they're like grossly underpaid. The majority of the people doing the work. It's just been interesting. Like the actual numbers are starting to come out a little bit because people are being really candid about like the state of the industry, and it's it's wild. Like, uh, like I think it was the actors, like how like eighty percent of them don't break. 30k a year or Mm -hmm. something and so they don't qualify for health insurance and it's like but but like the industry relies on those people like they need those people working you know but it's just like you have this whole with writing and acting you have like this whole class of people that have to just like you know barely survive and and only like a small number of people trickle up to actually be successful yeah i also heard that they they like create jobs to justify underpaying people like like they'll hire writers to be in a writer's room and to do the exact job of the writers but they'll hire them as writers assistants or something yeah. mm-hmm. and then they'll just make them do the exact thing and pay them like half as much yeah yeah most like most bottom level positions in the industry in any department whether it's writing or production or lighting or art or or anything it's uh the bottom rung is the assistant the pa 
the production assistant and it's a unlivable wage unless you have like some kind of privilege which is something i think dan Harmon said it on Harmon town that uh entertainment is an industry where you have to be insanely privileged just to be like a slave yeah yeah that's the thing i mean it works kind of similar to like how internship stuff works a lot of the time it's like what you have to have money and support to be able to do the unpaid internship and so it's like it's a class marker i I remember reading something a while back about how like like how college degrees have become really devalued over like the last generation or so and part of that is because college degrees used to be a class marker and it's like this was a proxy to signal your class or signal your status without actually like saying the thing or whatever it's like oh if this person bothered to get a degree or bothered to get like a higher ed degree or whatever that it was uh that like they had support they were the right kind of people you know mm. uh and so they would get the right kinds of jobs but that it then it then there was the push for everyone can get a degree everyone should go out and get a degree it no longer became a valuable class marker and so now it's like not nearly as useful as it would yeah. have been you know and now it's all the it's the you just look for the thing where well you can only do that if you already have money that's the thing that's going to be used to decide who gets the prestigious whatever yeah but in that push for like everyone to get a degree like the majority of us had to take out loans so that yeah. so the devaluing of the degree was a real kick in the dick yeah it really was <laughs> it was like at the same time that there was this big push of like anyone can and should go to college everyone should go to college it was also like uh the the cost of it was growing exponentially and they're just writing like these bullshit loans the way that like they did for like housing and the housing crisis or whatever it's like it's, a, it, it's just a scam this whole fucking country is a scam it really is my um degree doesn't exist anymore like the what, what do you have uh, I have a degree, a BFA in film production from CU Boulder. CU Boulder, the joke about it at the time was as America's most private public school. Because mm. it's not a private school, but only 3% of its funding came from the government. Mm. Um, but anyway, like the year after I left, they like got rid of all the film projectors and all the film cameras and stopped teaching film. And it became the department of like, like moving, moving images arts or something like that. Mm -hmm. So if you Google my program that I graduated from, it's not around. It became like immediately obsolete. You were taking your last final and they were sitting there tapping their watch like, you got to get out of here. We got like the movers coming to like clear all this out <laughs> yeah. as soon as you're gone. I should. I think it was like sophomore, junior year when like Kodak went out of business. I was like, this isn't a good sign, but sunken cost fallacy. Better follow through. And it was such an art school too, like. Like we we made we made film, you know, like on celluloid, edited on Steinbeck's, which is something no, even at the time nobody was doing it. What is a Steinbeck? It's a giant. I, do you you know Olivia? Yeah, you, you went to I was school. just struggling to make a joke about the guy that wrote like the, the parole grapes or of whatever, wrath, but I couldn't get there. <laughs> yeah, you you know that kind of thing was like a novelty thing. Like it, I also have a BFA in film, but we didn't really mess with much of like the obsolete analog technology right except for like just the novelty of it but it like it is fun it's like a, it's a totally different thing and and you get you get a very particular look that you can't really quite recreate exactly the same with working in digital someone gonna explain what it is or am i gonna be left to wonder <laughs> it's a big machine that you sit at sort of like a light table like the cutting machine yeah and you put your like you the film strip goes over this like panel of light and and you look through uh goggles that look down at like a microscope kind of so that you see the image in each frame and then okay. phys physically with scissors cut the film uh -huh. and then okay and then glue it together <laughs> yeah it was like a tape kind of <laughs> okay like a real tape yeah uh and you would be constantly doing math because you know, now you just, you go into Premiere Pro and you make a cut in your film and you play it back and you're like, fuck, that wasn't right. And you rewind and try again, control Z, try again. But back then you were, you were doing back then, 
<laughs> like, <laughs> like I was an editor on fucking the first Star Wars. <laughs> this was 2000 fucking 12. <laughs> no one else was doing this. We were the only 20 people on the planet doing this. Uh, at least for a degree. But you would like be doing math where you're like, okay, that was 56 frames from this scene. That means it's roughly this many minutes long. And if I wanted to cut like right after, you know, 12 seconds after the actor makes this look, I should do it right here. And then you would you know like, what? you would tape it up and then go put it on a projector and watch it and be like, fuck. <laughs> was, is that like your one shot at it? Like once you've cut it, you could like, you're fucked. you could go and Frank and sign it again, but you know. Not too many times. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know what's funny to me though is when like old people get mad about things being easier now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like the people who got mad that they had to pay their student loans when other people like, don't you want people to not have to do that? <laughs> it's like Yeah, and that was back when like my great uncle talks about that how he paid off his student loans work while he was in college working at McDonald's. And it was like, well, yeah, that was $4,000 total. Yeah, dude, <laughs> different thing. My favorite is when people, <laughs> I've heard this a few times, people referring to like backup cameras and cars as cheating. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, like, that's a safety feature. <laughs> if the game is don't run over a ch child, then I'll <laughs> fucking cheat all day. <laughs> Uh, that just reminded me that lately I've seen several people, old people, in cars when I'm driving, holding on for dear life to that little, like, handle Yeah, that's, like, in the passenger seat. It's infuriating. Yeah. The oh, the oh shit handle, as my buddy calls it. Yeah. Yeah, like, so, so me and Olivia were talking about this, because it's, at, like, she's, like, oh that's kind of annoying and i was like i i hate it pisses me off so much and then we were we were like looking looking into it i thought like maybe it's like an archaic uh like safety feature from like before there was seat belts and they've just left them in or something it's for hanging it's clothes like when you're, isn't it when uh no it's not it's not specifically for hanging clothes it's i guess to help pull you out of the car like you oh. can grab onto it to help like lift yourself out of the car. Never you're seen kind anyone of giving use it people the benefit of the doubt and being like, oh, like maybe they're holding on to it because back in their day that was what you had to do. Yeah. <laughs> but, but no, they're just assholes telling you your driving is bad. It's the most passive aggressive thing in the world. <laughs> I mean, I hold on to that, but that but I'm like it doesn't matter how you're driving, I'm just nervous in cars. So why do you hold on to it, though? What is it going to do for you if you Nothing. get into a wreck? <laughs> I have anxiety. It's comforting. It's like a stress ball. Oh, no. Zach is one of those people. Oh, man. I don't do it to be a dick. <laughs> do it unconscious. It's like, it's like biting. It's like biting your nails. There's yeah. like... A there's like a brand of, of elderly person that will do it to be like, oh, you're going too fast. And I, I don't care yeah. for that. No, uh, I, I understand that. Yeah, when I was learning to drive... <laughs> I don't know how it is in other places, but in the state of Maine, your first, like, however many months that you have your permit, you have to have somebody in the passenger seat with you. Right, yeah. And uh, whenever it was my dad, if I approached a stop sign too quick, he would, like, put a hand and foot on the dashboard. And I'd be like, dude, I'm going to stop. See, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, so I understand, the, like, the theatrics. that it, I understand that being annoying. That, that did uh, uh, piss me off. Oh man, I, I might just... actually be grabbing onto that thing when we've got a teenager driving the car, though. Mm -hmm. Like, <laughs> I think back to when I was learning to drive and like well into my early 20s. I think it's just a brain development thing. Like, I was like speeding and like, <laughs> like getting into fender benders for a while. Like, it takes a while to like actually learn how to be a good driver. Like, I've not, I can't remember the last time I had like any kind of problem. But like for a while there into my early 20s, I was like not a good driver. <laughs> yeah. I remember the first time I merged onto the highway. I thought I was going to shit my pants. It was so terrifying. And then like a couple of years later, my cousin and I had a game where because this was before like GPS. I mean, it, GPS existed, but n neither of us had like a Garmin and we didn't have smartphones. <laughs> So if we were going somewhere and one person knew the way, but the other person didn't, so they had to follow that person, we had a, 
a game where the person leading the way would try to lose the other one. And so it turned into like a, a police chase on the highway where we were just driving. Like, we were like 19-year-old idiots just driving in the shoulder and stuff, like just acting like it was bad boys too. So, yeah, teenagers are idiots. I was trying to be safe. I was trying to be a safe driver, <laughs> and I was crashing my car. Yeah. I mean, I've come full circle. I'm back to shitting my pants, merging on the highway. <laughs> yeah. I think if you get into a car as a passenger, it's your responsibility to just, like, quietly accept death. <laughs> <laughs> just, like, embrace it. Embrace your powerlessness in the face of, like, the torrent of, you know, flying metal. And just, you know, you don't control your own life. It's okay. That's the only way I can fly on a plane. <laughs> I get to the airport early and I go to the bar and I drink my last beer every time. <laughs> I just take the length of the beer to come to peace with my fate. Something freeing about that. Yeah, and then when you get there, you're, you're like, <laughs> hey, you're like, hey, I've never oh been to... So this is Philadelphia, huh? Cool. <laughs> You're like so stoked to be Life alive. Goes on. <laughs> a month ago, going to Philly sounded like shit. Yeah, but when you're living on borrowed time like that, yeah, every day's a gift. <laughs> right. <laughs> Even Philadelphia is a gift at that point. <laughs> it is a good viewpoint to see the world as a dream. So, guess who suddenly started dreaming again? Oh, do we have a Victor dream? Victor yeah. just was having dreams. He's just a been having days. them. They not the last two nights, but they're like yeah, there were like three days where I was dreaming. Do you have one you want to uh, get into? Uh, yeah, I I wrote one down, and so we can. Oh, we can... sweet! Because if you didn't have one, I feel like it was my turn, and mine was pretty weak. Well, we might still. Have time. Might still dip our toe in, into that. We could okay. also do my sexy Eeyore dream. Well, having a lot of those. <laughs> <laughs> those specifically? Just the one. <laughs> um, no, I have been having a lot of milk horror dreams. That was my nickname in high school, by the way. <laughs> Nick horror? No. M milk horror, I mean? <laughs> no, sexy, sexy Eeyore. Eeyore. Oh, sexy Eeyore. <laughs> I don't know where Nick Horror came from. <laughs> Nick Horror? Uh, that was my wrestling name. <laughs> <laughs> my porn name was HP Love Shaft. Okay. I really don't remember this dream at all, but I've written down, so it's going to come back to me as I'm reading it to you guys. <clears throat> but, so, dreamt I was with Olivia. I was driving, and we were leaving a parking garage. I scraped several cars trying to leave, uh, and I try to just keep going, but I get stopped by, like, a vague barrier at the exit. Like, I remember I was, like, I, like, hit a car, like, scraped a car coming out of my parking spot, and I was trying to get out, and I, there was, like, a couple of cars, and it was, like, it, would, it was getting, like, more and more narrow approaching the exit, and I, like, scraped a car trying to get to the exit. And then by the time I got to where I could leave, there was, like, something, something blocking me. Um, and then a guy walked up to my car and says I hit his car and asked for my insurance. And I start trying to stall. <laughs> uh, and then he asks for my phone number. Uh, and I take the little piece of paper and a pen and I try and write my number down, but I can't write on the paper. Or, like, I can't write my number down. And so this ends with all of us going to my grandmother's house. And she isn't there. Um, and so it's, like, two people that are with me and Olivia. It's the guy. It's, like, they were both in the car, I guess. Um, so we all go to my grandmother's house, which is the house I grew up in. And one of the guys was friendly, and uh, the other guy was kind of angry and mean. Uh, and they were waiting as I tried to write down my phone number. We were sitting in the dining room. Um, and this has happened to me before in dreams where I'm like trying to do something over and over again. And I can't get it right. It's like, it was all wobbly because it was a dream. And so it was like, I kept just trying to write my phone number over and over again on a piece of paper. And it's like, 
I would write it and I would write the wrong digits or I would like get it mixed up or whatever. I just kept trying over and over again. And it did vaguely feel like a hostage situation, but they just wanted my phone number. And then I think uh, the mean guy escorted Olivia to the bathroom on the other side of the house. And then I heard a struggle, like maybe the guy hit her. And so I ran over and attacked the guy and like smashed his face into glass and like attacked this guy. And so it was like a, it was like we were fighting our way out now. And so we return to the dining room and the nice guy's seen what happens and he goes for his gun and I run into the kitchen and I grab like a large kitchen knife. Uh, and then this guy approaches the kitchen and instead of a gun, um, he has a giant mason jar that was full of uh, pepperoncini peppers. <laughs> Uh, it was like, it was like a big glass, like water gun, but filled with like, but it was also <laughs> like a jar of peppers. Um, and it had one of the peppers jammed into a hole at the top that kind of looked like the hammer that you cock on a gun. It was just like, like a little plugged pepper in the top of this mason jar. Um, and we have like a standoff where he's got his, his jar and I've got my <laughs> knife, uh, and he starts like spraying the stuff around is like spraying his water gun or whatever and i start like swinging my knife at him and i have written here he makes a do you feel lucky punk style speech about whether his 10 gallon mason jar is full of pepperoncini juice or gasoline (laughs) (laughs) Uh, and eventually i like stab the guy with the point of my knife it was like i kind of like get it i like nick him in the gut and then he's like lost it and he's like spraying this juice everywhere. And then when his gun is finally empty, he like staggers and then falls out of the window down into the yard and dies. Uh, and then Olivia and I reflect on how we liked the guy and say he was like a fun uncle. <laughs> <laughs> and okay. This this is super this next part is super weird. I don't know what to make of it. I've had this kind of experience before in dreams, but it's like I will I will experience a dream as if I'm getting hit with like like a swirl of memories, like a rapid experience of memories or like I'm like really quickly remembering a bunch of stuff I forgot or like going through like rapidly through like some some memory experience or whatever. It's like. It's it's very hard to describe. It's kind of psychedelic a little bit. Um, but this one ended the that happened, but it went weirdly. It was um so saying something about a fun uncle triggered this like fake memory flashback and I was like quickly remembering a bunch of things that aren't true in like context that I barely remember about like my upbringing and how, how I got to where I was in this dream or whatever. Uh, and this is, this is weird. You guys are going to think this means something, but it probably doesn't. (laughs) (laughs) Sure. Uh, but the, the last, the very last thought that I had before I woke up was, I wish my parents had been the ones to abuse me. (laughs) And then I woke up. (laughs) Yeah, that sounds meaningful. (laughs) Weren't they, though? (laughs) That was the first thought I had when I was conscious. (laughs) I I had this memory of like, oh, my life would have been easier if my parents had been terrible. And I woke up and was like, they were. As opposed uh, to who? N- that's the thing. I had like, I think in the dream, it wasn't like true to my experience. It was like this notion that like, maybe I had been like, this is a vague memory, but it's like, I feel like in the dream, I had like, had some like yearning for their presence or something. And it's like, it would have been easier if like, that wasn't there or like, I don't know. I don't know. It's very vague, but I, but that is the first thought that I, that was the last thought that I had was like, yeah, I don't know. So anyway, that's that dream. Do you want to do yours now, Zach? Or <laughs> <laughs> I just skipped it. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, didn't you say, so you, you were having dreams like a few nights in a row and didn't you say that several of them, or like at least two of them took place in, um, your grandmother's house? Yes. Okay. So that's maybe significant. Yeah. And something we've talked about recently. Yeah. Houses. Yeah. And that's, that was the house that I grew up in. I was probably there from like seventh grade on. So like formative years were there. And it was like, like a lot of the time you'll have a dream where it's like, oh, you know, it's supposed to be this place, but it's this different place or like, like, oh, it's your house, but it's not your house or whatever. This was like, definitely my grandmother's house had the exact layout of my grandmother's house was like accurately depicting that place. And I don't know if it's relevant context, but when you lived in this house, you were not living with your parents. You were living with your grandma. Yes. Yeah. Hmm. Do you want to get into like, or do you have first impressions of this dream that you, you want to start off with? Yeah, I mean, I feel like the, the like scraping the cars thing feels like this like dream incompetence thing that um comes up. I, it felt like the same kind of thing that was like the inability to write my name or like to write my, my phone number or whatever. It was like just like dreamy failure to like accomplish certain things and then i remember being like like i was being super evasive about wanting to like i was definitely in the wrong and like i don't know why i had this big resistance to like to, like giving my insurance information or whatever i don't know i think like i think it felt like a hassle or something i don't know or like i don't know like i felt aggrieved in some way even though i was definitely the problem and um then like me feeling aggrieved turned into like oh these people are you know like holding us hostage or whatever yeah yeah the pepperoncinis is interesting because like correct me if i'm wrong but i I don't think you like those do you i don't know if i've ever tried one you're not like a pickled guy yeah not really oh i love pepperoncinis yeah, I like them too. I'll drink the juice. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not really not my thing. Um, and I remember thinking it was funny when I woke up and wanting to write it down. Like, I was like, oh, this will be fun to tell on the podcast. Was it pepperoncini juice or gasoline? I think it was pepperoncini juice. Yeah, yeah, I think he so never too. sprayed it though. No, he was spraying it all over the place. Oh, I missed that. Part. But I, I don't remember getting like hit by anything. Do you remember the other dream that took place in your grandma's house? Not even a little bit. Dang. Yeah. I was I trying to remember. find something on Dream Bible, uh, like adjacent to the car thing. Mm. But they really only have an entry for like accident, like like a car accident. But the side swiping of the vehicles is so much more specific than that to me. You know, like a car accident feels like much more dramatic and uh scary whereas like like you described this as being like like an incompetence thing where you're like god i fucked up a little and now i have to like exchange insurance information like it doesn't yeah. it feels more like shame and embarrassment based than a car accident which might be like fear based you know yeah like no one was hurt there was like m like a uh, monetary damage yeah. done well do you want to dig into symbols or would you be interested in approaching it with gestalt i i don't know that i'm gonna get anywhere with um uh, gestalt i uh it's been it's been like a couple of days and like if i was gonna do it i would probably do it with the guy with the pepperoncini gun but like but like i don't know that i feel like much of a connection there but we can we could try it i was looking at pepper on dream bible and then realized because at the bottom it says please see salt that that this mm. that it's referring to like pepper the spice and not pepper. Oh right. And then not like a hot pepper. So I went to the search bar to type in hot pepper and I typed in H O T P and it auto filled hot pants. <laughs> so apparently <laughs> hot Wait, in Dream Bible. Hot it, pants? Yeah. Hot pants are a thing people dream about. But not okay, forget my dream. What's hot pants in it's the like... Dream Bible? Oh, <laughs> It's like hot, like attractive. Yeah, like hot pants are like like tight pants, right? 
I guess so. I just I don't know if I've ever heard that. I think it's like expression. outdated. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds like it's like back when skinny jeans were like, a, "Whoa, look at that." <laughs> yeah, because yeah, the entry is like noticing how more positive, wonderful, or desirable the situation is. Noticing something better, more interesting, funner, nonstop luck, winning, success, sexiness. But the example is a man dreamed of seeing an attractive girl in hot pants. In waking mm. life, his slob rich father died, leaving him a huge inheritance and the ability to finally clean up after him. Damn. There were no hot pants in my dream. Was the mason jar a, hot, a water gun? Kind of, yeah. To dream of a water gun represents decisions that you know aren't positive. It symbolizes an awareness of your choices being improper. It may also reflect decisions that you know are a bit mischievous. A super soaker water gun may reflect a mischievous attitude that doesn't want to lose or likes rubbing it in. Well, definitely, like, I feel that I was being mischievous and, like, like I said, I was kind of the bad guy in this story. Yeah, like, you weren't doing anything atrocious, but, like... sounded like you you felt bad about it, though. Well, like, I I was definitely in the wrong. I don't know that I felt bad about it, oh, but, okay. like, objectively, I was not doing the thing I should have done. I found it, by the way. It's peppers, plural. That's how you get to, like, hot peppers. Mm. Gotcha. What are peppers? To dream of vegetable peppers represents feeling of noticing why it's good for you being more interesting, risky, dangerous, or potentially lethal than before. Oh, yeah, we <laughs> talked about this in... Oh, never mind. It never aired. Oh, yeah, the food episode. Yeah. <laughs> One day. I had a dream about peppers on a sandwich. But anyway, spicing up a situation or some area of your life, noticing that behavior is not terrible about why it wants to make life more interesting, upping the level of interest or risk in a situation or relationship. To dream of bell peppers represents feelings about something that's good for you being more interesting or risky than usual that cares about you for the rest of your life. <laughs> Possibly a symbol for feelings of relationship loyalty mixed with an interesting sex life. Loyalty that <laughs> likes noticing it isn't boring. Spicy family life or doing something more interesting than usual with family. Spicy Not, family life. Yeah. Not being boring with your family like it's normal. Not having to speak <laughs> about something being made more interesting. Accepting yourself the way you are without having to be bored by it. To dream of a jalapeno pepper represents feelings of noticing why it's good for you being more interesting or risky than usual that doesn't kill you. Interest or risk that you don't mind having a just a little bit of. Feelings of something being wonderful about why it carries you through managed risk without having to be lethal. So it's like fun, spicy, risky thing, but not, but it's just that. It's fun. It's not like bad. It's kind of a whole reflection of of the pepper water gun itself right like it wasn't a real gun it wasn't even like a gun full of gasoline it was <laughs> it was full of pepper juice so like yeah definitely not lethal yeah conversely maybe ga- a little spicy <laughs> the gasoline entry is much shorter to dream of gasoline represents emotional or psychological sustenance something that provides the energy resources or motivation to move forward a sign that your life needs to be re-energized in some way. There may be a situation in your life that you are struggling to get a handle on. So not as overtly positive, but I, w- I wonder if there's something there with the, like, is it pepper or is it gasoline question? Hmm. The gasoline thing felt like, well, like, I'm going to burn your house down, basically. Right. <laughs> is it right. is what it felt like. It felt like the, the point of it was less about the gasoline and more about like the threat of this is a more dangerous weapon than it appears. But maybe it is, like, maybe the meaning is connected. Oh, and he was kind of asking you, like, do you want to take this risk, right? Sure, yeah. Yeah, Super Soaker for, full of gasoline does feel like like a Batman villain kind of kind of weapon. <laughs> <laughs> or whereas a, a super soaker full of pepperoncinis feels like a jackass sketch. <laughs> well, do you want to gestalt the pepperoncini guy? Sure, we can try it. Was he the one with uncle the... energy? Yeah, the uncle guy. <laughs> fun. <laughs> I liked him. He was like a fun uncle. I've got um these pulled up. Okay, let me try and let me just try and get into the zone here. Okay, let's try it. 
as the Peppercini uncle, my purpose is uh, to make things right. My goal is to get the phone number. My biggest fear is Yeah, I'm not I'm not getting anything. I'm not sure I'm making a good connection here. We'll come we can come back to it. Okay. I love my brother. I hate. Got nothing. I desire. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm just I'm not able to get into the headspace of this character right now. Okay. Yeah. I think it's interesting. I also, when I've done the gestalt, those two questions, I fear and I hate, sometimes really get me stuck. And I wonder, like, yeah, I I'm wonder just... what that maybe says. Like, that I, I have a hard time going there to that place hmm. with those questions. And those are the two that got you stuck, yeah. too. I mean, it feels yeah, like but... more internal, right, to a character. Like, so, like, purpose and goal, you can almost kind of, if you're not connecting with, with this character, you can at least take a guess at purpose and goal because they're displayed through actions. That's what I feel like I'm doing right now. I don't, I don't feel like I'm, like, able to really, like, feel the character. Sure. Yeah. Maybe that's not what had the most energy. I mean. That's possible. Yeah. Or maybe it's just, you know, been a few days and... Or I'm not in the right headspace or something. It's one of those things where, like, we've said before about, you know, just cracking a dream in general. It would be weird if we batted a thousand. Like, I think it would come across like this podcast was staged or something. What um, do you think about the the other guy there? So it was this guy and his brother were there? Yeah, I think they were siblings. Oh. And did it feel like he was protecting his brother? Yeah. Yeah, I think they both wanted the same thing, but I I feel like it was the 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 nice guy. It felt like his car, like it felt like his deal. And the nice guy's the guy with the pepperoncinis, right? Yes, and the guy that like there was some struggle with you. Um, I don't. I think he was there to help the nice guy. Do you remember one? Like, when once you attacked him and like shoved his face into that glass, do you remember feeling like he for sure was gonna hurt Olivia and therefore you were doing the right thing, or do you feel like it was, um, I I don't know, overprotective? Yeah, it it felt like, yeah, no, it did feel like there was like a conflict, like like he was a real threat. I guess is what I was asking. Like, like I might have, I might have. I don't know that like Olivia was in like a lot of danger, but there was definitely like a, a like an actual scuffle that I was responding to. Yeah. Um. But then at the same time, it was kind of like a also like oh now's our chance to get out of here to like break out of here kind of thing. I think it's like it it triggered me to like leap into action, but then it wasn't just about that. It was also about getting us out of there. But yeah, I don't know, like, if I if I hadn't done that, like, I feel like my imagining of, of what happened there is that, like, like, very, like, escorting a hostage kind, kind of situation, like, maybe Olivia misstepped or did something that he didn't like, and so he, like, smacked her, but that it probably would have, like, stopped there, but I was responding to that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like, I don't know that, like, he was gonna, like, kill her or something. But the overall situation was worth getting out of, so it wasn't like your feelings around that action that you took were. were yeah, I don't positive, think, right? Yeah, I don't. It didn't feel like that was like a mistake. Yeah, no, that that answers that. Yeah, it wasn't a mistake to do. And like, I acknowledge that I I consciously can see like, well, I was in the wrong, but like, I didn't feel like I was doing the wrong thing during the dream. I didn't like feel like the bad guy or something i just felt like um like i had my motives and they had their motives or whatever it was a very morally neutral <laughs> interaction on my end no it does sound like you guys were like a hostage there was just like a good cop and bad cop dynamic with the 
the people running the scenario. I was just curious about your like, yeah, about your predominant feeling in the matter, whether it was, you know, anger, shame, like, I, I, I don't know. Yeah. I like, yeah, I felt like the whole time I was like trying to, like I was struggling to write my phone number. It felt like, it felt like I started out being intentionally evasive and then it kind of shifted into like not being able to comply, <laughs> not being able to do the thing that I needed to do. And it, like, it felt like I shouldn't have to, <laughs> like it felt like um not my fault or not my problem or whatever. Interesting. I feel like there's um a couple of things in here that point to this being about like a past thing um rather than like a like a present thing that's on your mind mm-hmm. like it be taking place in um your grandma's house and then the like memory flood at the end and the like the thought about your parents I I feel like all of that points to this being about something from your past and maybe if you is there anything like that was coming up for you around the time of the stream? Something that's been on your mind that you can connect to that? Well, just reflecting on the week, um, it's been like it's been busy. I've been like I've been I've been working on something kind of intently, and so I I haven't uh I haven't had a whole lot of downtime. I think the stream was on Tuesday. And I think that we were anticipating having to go do like a like a family get together thing that um felt like kind of like an obligation of like oh man, it's gonna be a pain to get down there like on a Wednesday night after work, but I feel like I have to do this and so we're gonna do it, or I'd feel guilty if I didn't, so I'm gonna do it. Um and then, yeah, yeah, I don't know, broadly, it's just been, like, like a lot to worry about, a lot, lot on, a lot to think about, and then also just, like, trying to, or, like, having a hard time finding time to, uh, like, relax, you know, which I think I, I sound like a broken record, I feel like I said that a lot, but it's been, it's been emblematic week of that of like well I'd like to relax I'd like to do just I'd like to just like do nothing but I'm gonna work on this stuff and if I wasn't working on this stuff there'd be this other stuff that I should be doing and if I wasn't doing that other stuff there's other stuff that I really should be doing um and there's that kind of that's kind of where I've been at this week so so I guess a lot of like obligation or a lot of like um responsibility stuff lately um and so maybe you know because i was trying to evade like a responsibility maybe that's a connection yeah that fits the theme of like a quasi hostage situation sure yeah it's like oh there's this thing i should be doing and i'm doing everything i can to avoid doing it yeah maybe that's what it is Especially if you're feeling like burnt out and like, therefore I'm just relating <laughs> at this point. Cause yeah. I've, I've been super busy and then feeling like I'm uh, not living up to expectations in certain departments. Um, namely at work for me, but like maybe something different for you, but like, I like j- just not quite like meeting expectations. But then part of me is like, I'm tired. I don't care. That's like what the well, writing down the phone number thing makes me think of. If if the you know quote unquote hostage situation is like obligation, yeah, that that might be. That does kind of feel right. Yeah, yeah. It's like I I created obligations by being uh, irresponsible, trying to get out of the parking space or whatever, and um, and the rest of the dream is me avoiding it and then like getting around it by like. Yeah, because I don't really deal with with it. Like, like the violent the violent tack that I take is not really like the solution. I guess. I mean, I guess it solved the problem, but it wasn't really like I didn't ever really like come around to doing what I was supposed to do. Yeah, but you also didn't feel like you had to do it. 
or that you should have had him do it. Sure. Yeah. You got any thoughts, Olivia? Yeah, I guess just the, yeah, just like the, well, this is like kind of come up for both of us recently, like feeling obligated to like appease family members in a certain way or like keep other people happy and keep the peace. But yeah, I don't know. Yeah. 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 Family did come up a lot in multiple Dream Bible entries. Came up in the Pepper entry. Yeah. You refer to this guy as like an uncle kind of character like or as having uncle vibes mm-hmm. and he's with his brother hmm. yeah I, I i really think that this is like a family related dream um, it's your grandma's house yeah what other symbols did you feel were i had a couple pulled um, up oh go ahead i was gonna say maybe like um parking garage oh yeah we've read that one before it's where it starts it's you and me trying to get out of a parking garage I thought it was interesting, like, how I got stopped from leaving. Like, I just want, like, I was trying to get out, and, like, I was almost there. I should have, by all rights, been able to leave. And my dream threw, like, some vague bullshit up to keep me from leaving so that I had to deal with this guy coming to my car. Hmm. I can only find parts. Just weird. It was almost, like, video gamey, you know? It was, like, there. I remember seeing something in my way. But, like, it definitely felt like I hit, like, a boundary of a video game where it's like, you're not allowed into this area yet. You have to, you have to complete your quest in the, in the parking garage of getting guilt-tripped by a guy for a thing you did wrong. I found something that's, like, uh, maybe close. In the driving entry, there's lots of, like, sub-categories. But if your view is blocked or obstructed while you're driving, does that feel... I don't know. No. We okay. and we could read it, but I don't know that that feels applicable. Well, so okay, so driving is all about control, um, decision making, and or mm. the direction a situation your experience is taking, mm. and so all of these little sub paragraphs here are kind of like what you would expect, right? So like if you're missing your turn, it's like you're not paying adequate attention to a situation. Mm. If you're driving and you can't see the road ahead, it's a sign that you don't know where you're headed in life. So, like, what when you were describing this dream, I was picturing like it it sounded like the the garage and the the part of the garage that you were driving through was getting more and more narrow, right? Mm -hmm. It's like claustrophobic and like I don't know, like inadequate space to maneuver. Um, I'm just trying to relate that back to like. The, what driving means yeah cause the the parking entry is also parking structure just redirected to parking but it's also about decision making but it's just you know about having to like stop focusing on a goal or like putting things aside a parking lot is an issue you're or a situation that you're stuck in so it's hmm. pretty much the same as the driving entry just you know not in motion a parking lot is a situation that you're stuck in a lot a parking lot and a garage are very similar hmm. And that, and you were literally stuck in the parking garage. Yeah, yeah. So uh, being like driving is decision making, and parking is like, like maybe it just being like in your head, like no movement on stuff. Yeah, it sounds like dry, like, and you were trying to drive, but you were being stopped. Yes, and then I don't remember how we got to my grandmother's house. It was just like we went we went from being in the garage to being at my grandmother's house. There's no driving there or anything. That first scene, I my best guess at what that means just like symbol-wise is like feeling stuck and like kind of having no choice but to engage with this this situation or like like that I am making mistakes or acting recu- recklessly because I'm I don't have like space to operate or whatever Mm. or i can't get i can't accomplish my goal of leaving the stuck place that i'm in that feels right actually okay that's interesting did the phone number in the in the the writing down of it feel like um (laughs) what oh maybe you didn't hear i just dropped my phone it was very loud oh no i didn't hear it at all um the writing down of the phone number did that feel significant like a symbol or was that just like because that is what you would do in a, in a yeah you did like, that is what i would do yeah right yeah no it's, it's like a real life mechanic 
So did it just feel like that or was was that like significant? Because there's a Dream Bible entry for phone number. Oh, um, that's interesting. Well, there was a lot of, th- I mean, it was about, I need to give this information to like make this right because I've, I've injured this person basically. Like I, I did damage. So this is how I even things out. But I spent a lot of time trying to write my phone number over and over again. So yeah, maybe there's something to a phone number. Um, as an entry yeah i mean it's real short it it, it it feels like it ties to the other stuff like thematically to dream of a phone number represents what is required of you to initiate a desired experience a resource ability person or situation that you need in order to make something happen yeah yeah no this makes this it feels like this makes some sense if you look at it through the lens of me like if you look at it like it's a project's dream yeah I was just thinking that. <laughs> if it's a if it's a project stream, then it makes a lot of sense. But I'm like still convinced that that second part is like a family dream. Yeah. Yeah. No. I mean that makes sense to me. But the um, but it it sounds like those like at least this week have have been like at odds, kind of you know at least like yeah time wise like you have these projects you're working on and then these family obligations and you're starting a family of your own, which is you know. Uh, also something you want to be focused on. So, yeah, I don't know. Maybe you're just, like, feeling super spread thin. Yeah, and, uh, like, I just feel like I've been I've been stuck in the same place for a long time of, like, I want to get something off the ground. Like, I, I want to get the ball rolling with something. And I feel like if I can manage to do that, then I can, then I can let that thing do its thing. I can, I can, like, give that the appropriate amount of space and time and make more room in my life for the things that actually matter, you know, like be more present in my life and be more present like in my relationships and be more present with like this exciting thing that is happening, uh, in, in my family with Olivia. Um, and just, I am locked into this place where it's like, I'm throwing myself at trying to figure out a thing that that feels like satisfying on on that level, like where where like I know what I'm doing with that part of my life, so that I can be more present in the other stuff. But like while I'm busy doing that, I'm not as present as I need to be in everything else, and I just feel like torn, you know, torn torn between those things of like. Well, if I can, if I can crack the thing that like I'm working on that is like, that that's like working, you know, that's functioning, that's like, that's like productive instead of just spinning my tires all the time, then things will be so much better, right? If I can't, like, until I've cracked a thing, until I figure that out and it feels like I'm constantly torn between like, well, do I throw myself into that as much as I can to try and get to that better place? Or do I like put a pin in that or like give that less of my attention? But th- th- right. does that uh, so that I can like, you know, focus in more on day to day stuff? But then is that like putting me further away from the better place that I'm trying? Do you get right? Do you get what I'm saying? Like, yeah, I follow you. But like, and so when well, I get really what's sucked it, into something like that, what does cracking the thing look like? Like, to you? Like you're talking about like music? I, no, no, it's not. It's not artistic. Like I'm excited about the music thing happening. Like I've got, I got an album release show happening next weekend. Like I'm yeah, like that's we, chugging along. I wish I could be there for that. We'll send you a vinyl. Um, oh yeah. But now I just like, I want to have some kind of like, I want to have a, I want to have some way to like have like a like a, oh man. I'm struggling to I'm 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 having a hard time even saying it cuz it's an, it feels like embarrassing to say. I want to find a way to to like make money myself, disconnected from my job. Doesn't have to fully support me, doesn't have to take care of everything, but I want to be able to do a thing and be able to like at least partly support myself with it and have it be a thing that I'm doing that I like doing that I care about. And that's never going to be music. 
Like, yeah, I'm just, I have zero interest or inclination in trying to make money with music. It's just a thing that I do because I love it. And so I love it and it's cool. It's a fun thing to have there, but it is purely just a thing that I do for the art of it. Like no interest in trying to make money off of that. So it's like I constantly am bouncing around. It's like, well, maybe I can do this and that would be like a trajectory for me. Or maybe I can do that. Or maybe I'll come back around to this other thing that I was working on. I'm constantly fucking digging away at that because like I'm not real happy with my job. I'm not real happy with my career uh, uh, trajectory or prospects or whatever. And it's like you'd like to be more self-directed. Yeah. And I'm not exactly more autonomy. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm not exactly eager to like jump into another day job either. Like, so maybe I'm fucking an idiot for trying to figure something out, but like, I really would get a lot of satisfaction out of figuring something out that I can do for myself. Um, eh, I sound like an asshole. Lots of people do do that though. You know, like you're not an asshole for thinking that's a possibility. This whole fucking country is built on like selling that possibility to people. That's what makes me sound like an asshole. <laughs> but it, it like I get that it's like it's not like just an easy peasy thing that anyone can just do, you know, but it, it, like it isn't impossible and a lot of people do it and a lot of people have great success w- with like starting their own business. Um Yeah, especially with your experience. Whatever that looks like your experience and skill sets once once you actually describe what breaking the thing looks like to you i was like oh yeah that that sounds totally doable cuz at first i thought you were talking about music or or a project like that something creative and, uh, and no I, no i have no i have no ambitions of ever getting any success in that that'd be fun <laughs> but no absolutely not but it was no, it was not g- getting it was, co- it was i am 32 sir <laughs> it, and it was cognitive cognitively dissonant with the other thing you were saying because what you're describing is like trying to break through on something that would allow you to have more time you know with olivia and and in your relationships and the people in your life but like if you even if your album did like taylor swift good you now you have to make the next one and you have to like tour on it like it would take you away to su- oh totally to succeed in that realm but you're you're talking more about being like self-employed or like not having a boss or just being in control of your income and that that sounds like totally doable yeah that's that's where my head has been at for a long time and i just like have not cracked that i'm partly because i'm really particular about how i approach it i'm like a real do stuff by myself kind of person so it's like uh, trying to find a way to to do something that i can do independently without really relying on other people is hard you know yeah um and maybe a fool's errand and i've just wasted countless hours of my life trying to figure out something to do with myself but um i don't i don't really know how to operate differently i guess i don't know i don't think it's a fool's errand i think it's realistic not easy it's not like easy or simple but it's more realistic yeah then i but now i don't have my my rock star ambitions ended like uh days ago (laughs) (laughs) days ago earlier this morning yeah i was thinking about it this morning i was like nah that's that's not gonna happen so coming back to the dream is there like so there in the dream there's this thing that you're avoiding right the situation or thing that you were avoiding engaging with do you have a sense for what that might be like i said i feel like so like like today like i worked really single-mindedly on a project i'm i'm hoping to one day make money with and i put a lot of time into that and um i was tired at the end of the day from putting a lot of time into that and if i wasn't doing that i probably could have done some things that are just like good for life and soul and like dead stuff that was like you know good for just day-to-day living and done more to like prepare for us starting a family and things like that. But instead, I worked really single mindedly on this thing I hope will make money. And I do that a lot. And part of me feels like attention 
between like my impulse to do that because if it does work it will be it will feel really good and put me in a really good place i think but if it doesn't work then god what am i doing with myself i'm like throwing my life away i should be embracing like the day today joys of the day or whatever (laughs) yeah (laughs) it's like this it's like you throw yourself into pursuing like a a way to be autonomous or, or not reliant on your day job so that you can relax <laughs> yes and at the same time the act of throwing yourself into that is also you avoiding relaxation yes okay 100 percent. yes so i think that's your problem <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's what you would say because i i strongly believe that say you like cracked it that you you're like thing takes off and and it's like you don't have to worry about that anymore and it's like you can chill out would you though (laughs) i think i'd be a lot better really (laughs) yeah i do i do think i would be a lot better (laughs) okay i know i know that's hard to believe it is i do think i do think i would be a lot better than i am i think you it's a compulsion of yours to keep your mind busy I do like having my mind busy. That's true. Um, yeah, I don't know if there's any way to tie this dream up, but do you have any like final thoughts about it? It does make some sense to me now. I think what what I'm getting out of this is I need to work even harder. <laughs> <laughs> I think you made fun of me on a previous episode for earnestly coming to the same conclusion about a similar <laughs> dream. Yeah. Like I had a dream about that was telling me to relax and I I my response was like, so I just got to buckle down and like <laughs> really figure out how to get to a place where I can relax. Yeah. But you I mean you you get where I'm coming from, right? It's oh, like yeah, there's for this sure. tension. It's like thinking that you can like dig your way through the mountain, right? And stopping is well, okay, now you're just in a mountain. It's a it's a it's a mental game, I guess. I it's don't a know mental illness. I don't know. What the, I don't know what the right way to approach it is. Ther- therapy? Yes, that's what I've been saying. I didn't understand anything either of you just said. <laughs> Are you breaking up, Zach? Are you breaking up, Olivia? In person, shouldn't be. I mean, maybe it's the headphones. I mean, my headphones are busted. Well, good news for you. I single-handedly met our deductible on our health insurance. So you could you. get therapy for $25 a session for the rest of this year if you wanted to. <laughs> I don't trust them. She's done most of the work. What a lot of listeners don't know is that Victor is actually a Scientologist <laughs> and uh, isn't allowed to do therapy. Right. Yeah, just every time I do it, my Thetan level goes up. Isn't that right? Yeah. Thetan. And then you get yeah. cattle prodded by Tom Cruise. Yeah, he keeps requesting me specifically. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know why. It's supposed to be a random draw, but... I think you just make the funniest noise. <laughs> 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 but, uh... Yeah, I feel like a lot of times when we're... When we're doing this, it, uh... The, the symbology or the gestalt or, like, whatever... The, the conversation whatever methods we use that ends up being generated like so, like sometimes it gets off or it feels like it's getting off track from the uh the beat by beat interpretation like the, like it feels like there are um unconnected threads you know what mm-hmm. i mean like there there are symbols that have yet to be like specifically nailed down or like pieces of the story of the dream that have yet to be interpreted but i i yeah i feel like if it if it gets us to a point where we're like talking about a thing that like clearly seems like it's been on the dreamer's mind and and they have a lot to like say about it and like to express about it it's got to be about that thing right yeah at at least partially you know yeah and like with this dream I, i really do feel like the idea of like me like first me scraping the cars does feel connected to like ways in which i feel like maybe i i'm I'm dropping the ball or not being as uh, not being everywhere at once, you know, the way that it would be nice if I could be, you know, and then like this, like this whole thing about me being really resistant to 
meeting this obligation just it really does feel like it resonates with like some like resistance or like resentment I have about like having to do these things that I know I should do um when I feel like I'm doing so many other things you know that's a that's a thing that I'm like trying to work my way through into a like land in a healthy place with and it makes a lot of sense to me that I that I'd be dreaming about it yeah Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, I didn't see any of that before we started talking about it. And now that we're talking about it, it feels like what it's about. So we got somewhere. Thank you for listening to The Young and the Restless. You can follow us on social media at The Young and the Restless Pod and submit your dreams for interpretation to The Young and the Restless Pod at Gmail. And as we always say, you, you don't, don't have, have to call, call your parents. parents. Make you a tiger like-